Good morning, brothers, sisters, and friends. We are honored to have our guest faculty candidate on campus, and so welcome to him. Uh, we also welcome Dean Steve Schweitzer to the pulpit this morning. Steve will be speaking to one of his passions, um, which is the Black Panther. And our guest candidate has written an article on Black Panther, so we will do our best not to have conflicts of interest here. <laughs> but welcome to all of you. Um, just a quick note, all of our hymns will be coming from the hymnal supplement, which is the smaller blue book um, at your seats. But let us worship together, brothers and sisters. Will you rise in body and spirit for our call to worship? Blessed creator, master storyteller, you who inspire and challenge us with the stories passed down to us from brothers and sisters of long ago. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to new and different stories. For it is through stories that we make sense of the world. It is through the telling and the receiving that we connect to one another and to you. And it is through hearing, truly hearing, stories that are not our own, that we expand our horizons, our understanding of ourselves, our place and purpose in this world, and our relationship to the world and to you. Help us to hear truly hear one another and to respect the stories of others even if we cannot immediately or fully understand the content or context. In your name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn we will sing verses 2, 3, and 5. you join me in our litany of confession, you will read the bold. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be human. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. 
Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, and free us from our sin. Scripture reading from the book of Isaiah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifice, says the Lord. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more, bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And from James, anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, commits sin. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. In a moment, we're going to view a few clips from the film Black Panther. I want to provide a bit of context and background regarding these five clips for those of you who may not have seen the movie, you may not everyone has, and you may not recall the details, or at least not um, as I hope to unpack it. And following the clips, we will then turn to the sermon. Black Panther was released in 2018. It was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, it won three of those. It is the highest grossing film by a black director and the ninth highest grossing film to date. Black Panther is the 18th movie in the expansive Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU, which currently consists of a massive 23 films, several series on TV and Netflix, and a myriad of comic books. The films were released in three phases that are inter interconnected by plot and characters over 12 years, beginning in 2008 and culminating in 2019. Long process. Seven more films are coming in the next three years, can't wait, including Black Panther 2. Based on the Marvel comics, Black Panther is a superhero movie, but it's much more than a simple action film. The film engages in questions about race, ethnicity, colonialism, nationalism, isolationism, militarism, chosenness, loyalty, friendship, and individual and corporate responsibility. Many regard it as the best film in the entire MCU, and I would agree. It is certainly one of its most interesting films culturally, ethically, philosophically, and theologically. So some orientation. The film begins in our present day following the events of the MCU film Captain America Civil War, in which among many things, the king of Wakanda, a fictional African nation with advanced technology named T'Chaka is assassinated. 
Now his son, T'Challa, who has been idolizing his father, returns to Wakanda to be crowned king and to take up the role of the Black Panther. The Black Panther has special mental and physical powers due to ingesting the heart-shaped flower that contains vibranium, a super strong metal mined from a meteorite that landed in Wakanda millions of years ago. With vibranium, the Wakandans have built an advanced civilization. Wakanda has hidden in plain sight, choosing to avoid discovery and living in isolation from the rest of the world while embedding spies across the globe. The primary role of the Black Panther has been to protect Wakanda and its resources. The first clip we'll see shows an exchange between T'Challa and his love interest Nakia, who is one of the Wakandan spies, about Wakanda's isolationism and what Nakia believes Wakanda has a responsibility to do for the rest of the world. As the plot unfolds, a contender to the throne of Wakanda, Killmonger, great name, comes to this African utopia to challenge T'Challa for the kingship and the mantle of Black Panther. Killmonger's exchange with the museum curator in the second part of the clip correctly names the evil of colonialism and the violence enacted by European powers on the peoples and cultures of Africa. Later in the film, we learn that Killmonger is actually the son of T'Challa's uncle, who was a spy in the US, having thus a legitimate royal claim to the Wakandan throne. Killmonger was abandoned as a child in Los Angeles in 1992, the year of the LA riots, when Chachaka killed his own brother, Killmonger's father, who was planning to arm some of the African diaspora with Wakandan advanced weapons to overthrow their oppressors. Killmonger now seeks to carry out his father's vision, which would place those of African descent in power and as a result of a bloody coup across the globe, as you'll see in the third part of the clip. Taking the throne, Killmonger's plan to distribute these Wakandan weapons nearly succeeds, but of course, he is stopped by T'Challa and with the assistance of Nakia, his genius sister Shuri, the general of the Wakandan all-female special forces Okoye, and others. The events brought about by Killmonger's rise to power and violent revolution caused T'Challa to now reject Wakanda's withdrawal from other nations, as illustrated in the fourth part of the clip in which T'Challa confronts the spirit of his deceased father in the ancestral plane, challenging Wakanda's isolationism and the related choices that have given rise to Killmonger. By the end of the film, Wakanda plans to reach out with humanitarian efforts and scientific exchange. In the final part of the clip and the conclusion to the film, T'Challa announces to the United Nations that Wakanda will no longer remain in isolation choosing to take action and sharing their resources and knowledge with other countries. So now you are duly informed. What would Wakanda do? The film Black Panther asks this question of its characters and of the audience as it presents the fictional African nation of Wakanda untouched by colonialism, envisioning what Africa could be with an Afrofuturistic flair. It is precisely Wakanda's isolationism for millennia that has allowed it to have this form of existence and way of life. T'Challa cons is concerned that by opening Wakanda up to the outside world, their way of life could be threatened and it could even result in other nations exploiting or invading Wakanda to seize its precious vibranium. In contrast to T'Challa's fear, Nakia has seen the suffering and struggle of others and feels compelled to act, to provide aid and to share resources externally. It is her direct observation and interaction with others that have brought her to this conclusion. She has seen suffering and those in dire need of, of assistance. Nakia believes that Wakanda is strong enough to do both, to act responsibly and to maintain identity. In addition to his conversation with Nakia, T'Challa's shift in thinking comes as a result of learning about Killmonger's past and how his own father omitted the truth. T'Challa comes to believe that being Black Panther and King of Wakanda is more than protecting the country and its resources. Killmonger asked the question, where was Wakanda, when those in the African diaspora were being oppressed, enslaved, and murdered? Wakanda did not assist, did not intervene, but allowed such atrocities to be perpetrated while protecting their own self-interest. Killmonger holds out a new vision, one in which the sun never sets on the Wakandan empire, an obvious echo of the same phrase applied to the colonial expansion of the British empire. Killmonger's plan is openly supported by Wakabi, who speaks in terms of a smaller world that is catching up 
to Wakandan technology where there are only the conquerors and the conquered. It is time to turn the tables, even preemptively, so that Wakanda can be the former, the one with power. Again, this is a response born out of fear of what the outside world might do, what that imagines a continuation of the colonial model with Wakanda now as the role of colonizer. We see two different paths offered by the official leaders of Wakanda, isolationism, represented by T'Challa and the long line of Black Panthers, and militarism, represented by Killmonger. However, it is the third path of humanitarianism and justice, represented by Nakia, that ultimately is the one that T'Challa will choose for Wakanda to take in the future. The confrontation between T'Chaka and T'Challa in the ancestral plane is a pivotal moment where T'Challa must move past the idolization of his father and of Wakanda. His father says that the existence and abandonment of Killmonger as a child was the truth he chose to admit because he chose Wakanda, his people, as have all the Black Panthers before him. T'Challa's imp impassioned accusation that Wakanda was wrong to turn our backs on the rest of the world so that Killmonger is a monster of our own making places responsibility not on the colonial systems of oppression as much as they are guilty, not on individuals who do not represent the values of Wakanda as much as they are part of the problem, but on Wakanda itself and on the Black Panthers themselves, including himself, the new Black Panther. T'Challa claims such accountability for what Wakanda has done and its contribution to their circumstances, events, and realities that produced Killmonger. By omitting the truth about Killmonger, it is Wakanda's responsibility to act to prevent Wakanda from now taking this path of violence and militarism, of continuing the cycle of colonialism. T'Challa also states that fear stopped them from doing what is right. I find this sequence particularly striking in a film that seems to idealize Wakanda and then repeatedly and pointedly critiques it. Replacing one unjust system with another unjust system is not sufficient. The only path forward is to break the cycle. Black Panther illustrates how this might be accomplished. The first step in doing so is to name the truth that has been omitted. The second is to claim one's own role in being complicit rather than placing the blame on others. The third is to imagine something new, a possibility of what could be. The fourth is to overcome fear and clinging to one's place of privilege. And finally, one must actually take action that results in change, even in the face of risk and uncertainty. Now, while the film is explicitly about Wakanda, it is not too difficult to see the utopian depiction of Wakanda as a parallel or a cipher for other nations, including the United States, especially in terms of privilege, technology, militarism, and colonial attitudes. Of course, one could also easily extend this to the church, and particularly the white Western church. To echo T'Challa, we cannot, we must not, choose isolation or militarism. We must choose the third path offered by Nakia and eventually the one taken by T'Challa. In his speech to the UN, T'Challa proclaims that Wakanda will no longer watch from the shadows. Instead, Wakanda will become an example of how we can care for one another as if we were one single tribe. In times of crisis, the foolish build barriers while the wise build bridges. In our era of increased nationalism, protectionism, fear of the other, country first, the film rejects all of these perspectives. Rather, this new Wakanda is put forward as a model for our imitation. The answer to the question, what would Wakanda do, is very different at the beginning of the film and at its, at its conclusion. The shift we see in Wakanda is directly connected with the shift in understanding by T'Challa. His character development is clear and pointed. His growth in the film Black Panther actually begins in the previous film, Captain America Civil War. When his father is assassinated, T'Challa's response is completely motivated by revenge. He is ready to kill the individual he believes responsible, but he discovers that he has the wrong person. Ultimately, when T'Challa confronts the individual who is truly responsible for his father's death, he comes to realize that he cannot continue the cycle of revenge, but must stop vengeance from consuming him, it's his words. This story arc then continues into Black Panther as his character is challenged again to break the cycle of violence and to consider another path, a path of generosity and openness 
instead of fear and protectionism. That's the film. Now, as we turn to the biblical text, we find the prophetic voice in Isaiah 1 connects directly with the story of Wakanda in the MCU. The prophet denounces the nation of Israel for bringing sacrifices but failing to do justice, for going through religious practices without accompanying actions that defend the orphan and plead for the widow, according to verse 17. The people have an obligation to do what is right, namely to advocate on behalf of and care for the marginalized of society. Through the prophet, God tells them to stop bringing offerings if they are neglecting their responsibility for social justice. God rejects their religious observance because they have rejected justice. The people must move from concern for their spiritual relationship to the care of those in need. Their rituals can just stop if they do not choose the truth of extending assistance to the oppressed. They must no longer omit the truth, but do what is right. Those with power and privilege cannot continue in their isolated religious practices without engaging and improving the lives of those who struggle. The prophet emphasizes that faithfulness means working for justice, of risking oneself and one's position of privilege for the benefit of others. I would suggest the self-interest of Israel's religious practices parallels the Black Panther's primary concern to protect Wakanda. The passage in Isaiah 1 also instructs the people to cease to do good, cease to do, excuse me, cease to do evil, learn to do good. It is not simply do good, but learn to do good. This indicates to me a process rather than a singularity. It will not be fixed overnight. It will take time to create and implement new habits that must be learned, new mindsets, and our ability to remove old patterns. It will require effort, time, and attention. This transformation will not be accidental nor incidental. It must be intentional. And it will not be easy. But it is what God desires for us as God's people. Notice also that it is not enough to simply stop evil or stop doing evil. One must then do good, to do justice. In the film, it could have been enough for T'Challa and his supporters to simply stop Killmonger without extending aid and sharing resources. Once Killmonger, Killmonger is no longer in control, no longer a threat, T'Challa did not necessarily have to take that next step of opening up Wakanda to the rest of the world. But again, what would Wakanda do? T'Challa chooses to not only prevent war, destruction, and a military coup that would have resulted from Killmonger's actions, but then he does what is right in outreach and care. Wakanda will lead by example. It was not enough for T'Challa to simply stop the bad guy, to stop Killmonger's plan. The film could have ended there without Wakanda's subsequent promise of humanitarian aid and scientific exchange. However, following through on Nakia's desire to see Wakanda provide aid, T'Challa begins a new era and a new relationship with the other. Doing good and doing justice for the oppressed are also necessary. In a similar way, the prophet Isaiah calls the people not only to cease their evil ways, but instead to take positive actions for the benefit of others. And from here, I see the link to James 4. I personally find the verse in James 4.17 very challenging. Those who know what is right and fail to do it commit sin. Theologically, we speak about sins of commission and sins of omission, what we do and what we do not do. Often, the former type is much easier to identify as we can see our actions or their results more directly. What we don't do, however, can be more elusive and perhaps easier to dismiss. It's often easier to omit the truth, and in doing so, we stand guilty. As a whole, the book of James prioritizes actions. You know, faith without works is dead, but we must act. And we must act when we know what we should do. This is the challenge that Black Panther presents to its viewers and that scripture presents to us. It is not enough to simply cease doing evil. We must do good as well. We can no longer omit the truth. We must name our own complicity and oppression, hold ourselves accountable, and take responsibility if we are to break systems and cycles of oppression and to work at processes of reconciliation, restoration, and renewal. 
in asking the question, what would Wakanda do? We're asking, what would Jesus do? What would the church do? What would I do? We are called to cease doing evil and learn to do good, to care for the oppressed and the marginalized, to no longer omit the truth that we will not speak. But we must live out the values of our faith, even when it may bring risk. We are called to do justice as we move beyond self-interest and protectionism, as we choose to not omit the truth which desperately needs to be told. We must not build barriers. We must build bridges, joining with others in doing good and working for justice. Let us rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn. We are going to start on the left page with the refrain, Sia Hamba. We will continue to the right page for the first verse, and then we will return to the refrain with We Are Singing. As we go from this place, may you look for ways that you can do good, that you can work against the systems of oppression, and never omitting the truth that we must speak. Amen.